How's it going, ladies and bursts? I'm Bobby Sixkin, and welcome back to Sekimaru. It is nearly time for us to head back to Ashia Tower uh, in an attempt to to take the Sekimaru, I guess. But we shall see what's going to happen, although the time has already been changing. The, the, the present that we're experiencing is no longer exactly like it was uh, previously in our previous timeline, so either we're changing the past in an extreme way, like just the small changes we're making are butterfly affecting their way out and changing all god knows what or all the other people that potentially travel back with us are all running around trade changing shit up which it could be either or both even who knows with no snow falling there'd be hardly any movement outside a few people had to come to buy the remaining bread but time seemed to have stilled for a while i stood up from the chair and informed darfi that i'd be heading out all right shiroya have a good day It'll be 150 yen. I took out three coins from my wallet and handed them to him. He mirrored my smile, but not the underlying sadness behind it. Goodbye. I'll see you. I walked out of the door and stepped out onto the snow again. You won't be seeing me. I made some distance from Ina, brooding all the while. I had a hard time accepting that it might have been my last visit. I've been slowly walking down Ramon one. I stopped myself to stare at a street branching off on the other side. I'd taken that path many times to get to Atsuki's house, so I soon realised I was nervously biting my lip again. I didn't have anywhere to go, in more ways than one. A huge change in history had occurred. I'd never go back to the world I knew. That meant that making sure Atsuki and I couldn't go to the next event had become an even higher priority. It no longer had a downside. I decided the previous day that I'd do it on Thursday, but that was potentially a bad idea. I didn't know when Artsky would leave his house, and waiting in front of it all day wasn't something I wanted to do. After all, if, he, if it got too late, I'd have to ring the bell and face him. I didn't think I could do that. I only had one job, setting up a future that was perfect for everyone but me, then walking away from it. I couldn't fight that anymore. I crossed the street and walked through the narrow one, arriving at a part of Yushibana I'd always found pretty. That's what makes you a hero, Shidoya. Saving everyone else at the expense of yourself. At other times of the year, you could see the green leaves beneath the snow of the tall trees. The road was still white, but it was almost immaculate. I slowly crossed to the opposite sidewalk. Hatsuki's house was there. Before I got too close, a sharp pain in my chest stopped me. Could I really never enter it again? Could I really have been mere minutes away from going in and out of that door for the last time? I really couldn't believe it. I ran up to the gate before that hesitation could take hold of me completely. I looked through the bars. Maxi wasn't in front of the door anymore, but a small pause left imprints in the snow around it. He is here. There was a light behind a curtain. With no guarantee that Atsuki wouldn't see me, I stepped behind a tree. I really didn't want to be seen. If I talked to Atsuki, I was afraid that I would lose any resolve I had. I can't just stay here all day waiting for him to leave. I didn't even know if he will. There was a last resort available. Since I knew where he kept an extra house key, just behind the gate, I could try to enter the house and silently grab me his purse which had been left in the living room. Not now though. If it wasn't a coincidence that he was in hospital when I woke up, he should leave at some point. Would he leave if I call him from my phone and quickly hang out? I decided against that. That's a good idea, because he'd be like, oh, she woke up. Go to the hospital. Should I just wait here? I crossed back to the other side of the road and surveyed the door from afar. I looked around, and appeared I was the only person there. Most of the trees there were too thin to cover me, so there was nowhere I could safely watch from. I glanced at a corner far ahead. I'd be able to see the window from there. Slightly hesitant, I walked to it and peered at his house, as though, as I'd thought, I'd be able to see him, leaving, leaving while still being out of sight. There was something a bit worrying that I noticed, however. It was the trail of footprints I'd left. Will he notice the trail going behind the tree? It seemed unlikely he'd think it was suspicious, but he could find me by following them with his eyes. I just have to be careful. But no matter what I thought, it was uncomfortable. I couldn't take my eyes off the house and I didn't particularly enjoy the thought of spending my last real day in Ishibana spying on Atsuki. I need to do it though. I hid myself and leaned against the dark, cold wall. I recognised what I was looking at. I'd seen that very street the previous day when I'd been following Isla. That's right, there's no reason not to do the same with Isla, since I might know where she lives as well. Leaving Enric behind, I walked until a crossing street turned to the right. There was the entrance to the dead end I'd been looking at. 
I stared at the short house where the small footprints had ended the previous day. I couldn't see any light coming from inside and nobody was around me. Faded footprints were scattered all over the ground and some ended at that front door. I placed myself behind the same black car as before to avoid being right in the middle of the path. I wondered what to do. Changing the path no longer felt like an obstacle, so I was free to decide on anything. Isla should be at school, but I don't know about Edna, and I don't know if anyone else lives here. How the hell can I take their tickets for the event when I don't even know where they're keeping them? I considered two important facts. In the attic, Edna had implied they'd bought the tickets pretty early. That meant they were likely to have already had them. Secondly, before locking ourselves in the bedroom, everyone's possessions had been looked at. While tickets for the event had been found on almost everyone who'd been the visitor, none had been in Edna's purse. They were probably inside Isla's then. Could they already be there? The pressure of being in a crucial moment was getting to me. I stepped out and slowly approached the door. If Edna and Isla didn't go to the tower, different people would. It was very likely that as long as Ashia had the second wire, people would get trapped in that building. However, Isla's fate could be averted. And I could change the past. When I was in front of the door, I stared at the tiny white bell that was at its side. Edna and Isla don't know me. I could just press it. But what about Isla's friend? What was the truth behind that? Is someone else really living here with them? My arm reached out and touched the cold doorbell almost unconsciously, like it was another organism. But really, what should I say? I suppose that'll vary depending on who opens the door. I'd seen no light inside, so maybe nobody would. I firmly rang the doorbell. These long breaks are great for coffee, then. Is there actually nobody here? A day earlier, the small footprints had ended at the door, and it was close to the same time of the day that it had been. Hmm. I suspected I knew what the reason was. Isla, are you here? It's me, Shiroya. There was no reply. Is she out again? I wondered about it already, but my intention was to take the tickets from Editor and Isla. If I did that, Isla couldn't travel to the past, so perhaps, as it had already been deemed impossible, her friend no longer existed. But I'd seen her from the cafe during school hours. That must have been an Isla who travelled from the future. Why had she been out of her house? I figured she wouldn't have wanted to show herself anywhere, which is why she wasn't opening the door. Isla, are you here? I knocked on the door lightly, but it didn't seem like I'd be answered. The mystery behind Isla's friend was nowhere near solved. If the real identity was an Isla who'd come from the future, why hadn't she prevented herself from going to the event? My intention was to do just that, so my unease grew. Plenty of things about Isla had been questionable when looking back at it, but the voice recorder and her friend's existence were the biggest ones. I'd been standing there for a while and nothing had changed. Part of me wanted to give up, but the idea of her friend purposely not opening the door was one I didn't like at all. Suddenly the door opened wide and I saw the dark interior. There was nobody there. I simply tried to open the door and succeeded. It was unlocked. I grabbed the handle to make some noise, and I'd accidentally pushed forward. I didn't move. I kept staring inside until I was sure it was vacant. Then, I lightly pushed on the door a bit more and took a step, careful step in. I scanned the area and immediately noticed a wide assortment of items on the ground. Toys, dolls, colouring books and markers. In the corner was a pile of laundry and the walls had a few faded scribbles on them, as if someone had tried to wash them away. There were also pictures of a child at various stages of growth, and her mother was occasionally in the shop with her. I opened the entryway closet in search of the purse that was fought, faced with a few women's and girls' jackets. Scattered in the closet were clothes you wouldn't typically see when visiting someone's house. An apron with the name of a local restaurant, a uniform for a factory worker, and a cap branded with the logo of the convenience store. I didn't have to search for long. Right inside was the purse Isla had been wearing. She's got disguises in there. Is Edna part of Shin then? Her closet is full of disguises. Seems sus, man. Without hesitation, I looked inside. The most important issue was resolved immediately. The recorder wasn't there. I saw a pack of tissues and small sunglasses, but no tickets either. Wait, this is strange. When we found the recorder, I looked at this purse and the tickets weren't there either. Were they in Isla's pockets? I felt a sudden chill and looked at my sides. Nobody was there, but that in itself was very strange. Why is this purse here? Yesterday, the reason why I recognised Issa was precisely because she was wearing this purse outside. If she's outside right now, why is there purse here? There was some kind of creeping unknown dread at my back, but I immediately rationalised and rationalised it away. The person I saw yesterday was likely Issa's friend. She was wearing her purse, and she isn't here right now. 
then this piece belongs to the original Isla who was at school. If that's it, this makes a lot of sense. But why is the door unlocked? Was it a normal thing for them? And why would the other Isla be going anywhere during the day? I always leave my door unlocked. <laughs> like literally, every time I go out, I just start on bother. I don't even know where my house keys are. <laughs> the chance to take their tickets was there. Instead of focusing on specifics, I just had to take that simple action. And when I let go of the purse, I noticed I'd missed a lower pocket. I unzipped it and narrowed my eyes. All I saw were two folded pieces of paper that I easily recognised. I grabbed them with two fingers and unfolded them, confirming they were the event tickets. I didn't give another thought before dashing out and closing the door. What if the other wrestler also has the tickets? Duplicated. I froze up, realising how suspicious I must have looked. I instinctively crumpled the tickets in my fists, but nobody was around to see me. I breathed deeply and began to walk away, calm and nonchalant. I prevented it. I wasn't in my world anymore, but Isla wouldn't die. What would happen with Isla? If two versions of her really existed, then it seemed to both permanently persist in a single reality. However, I'd already decided that one was the better option, so I just put her in the same situation as me. I soon made it to the Enric Avenue. From the same corner, I saw light behind Artsky's window. I stared at it for a bit, but I gave up after a short while. I just wanted to go home and wait for tomorrow to come. I'd always liked walking through the street, but I turned around and moved to Ramon as I stepped through the thin, parallel path. Tomorrow, I'll definitely have to take out tickets, no matter how. It might not be as much of a priority as I thought, though. If I find the second mire in the tower and enter it during the night, I'll either travel through time or be caught by the police. If I travel through time, taking out tickets won't matter, since I'll change the past, and if I get caught by the police, there's no way Artsky won't learn about it. I'm not sure what would happen to my other self, but I doubted she and Artsky would just go to the tower on the 15th. I would still do it, just in case. For the time being, I simply kept going over the lottery numbers in my head, slowly approaching my apartment. When I was getting close, I saw the footprints I'd left earlier, but again, it seemed that the previous days weren't there. However much, however much my footsteps left impression, I was glad they were all bound to eventually fade. Of course, it was warm inside my apartment again. I shrugged off my coat almost immediately. I looked at my phone, it was 2.04. There was nothing else I wanted to do for the day, so I went to the kitchen after a long pause. As much as I disliked the idea of eating noodles again, I had nothing else. I didn't want to go buy food again because I just felt like I was doing something else in Yushibana for the last time. Like the day before, I washed the only pot I had and boiled a bit of water before dropping a stiff block of noodles in it. I waited for them to be cooked, sparingly moving them with two, two new chopsticks. When four minutes had passed, I poured most of the liquid out and let the noodles fall into a bowl. I knew exactly what their taste would be before I began to eat. It was getting, it was really getting old, but I powered through. The bowl was empty, and I could hardly tell I'd just eaten. I tried to lie on the floor, but it was a bit uncomfortable for my stomach. Instead, I grabbed the bowl and brought it back to the kitchen. I placed it in the sink and opened the cabinet with the food I'd bought. After inspecting it briefly, I indifferently closed the wooden door. I was about to drop the packaging of the noodles into the trash, but I remembered I'd thrown out the bag earlier. I took the roll out of the drawer and placed a new empty bag in the corner. I thought back on the tickets and looked inside my purse. I left both of them there, so I threw them in the garbage as well. I went back to sit on one of the scattered cushions. As much as I felt incredibly overwhelmed, I was out of things to think about. Eventually I dropped on the floor and mindlessly let time pass. It was ridiculous to think the walls, the walls around me, which I'd, only, which I'd seen for so many years, could soon disappear forever. There was so much uncertainty. No matter what awaited, my future was going to be miserable. Every scenario led to roughly the same thing. How was it going to be anything better than terrible? I would either get caught by the police or have to keep living with sketchy money I wasn't even sure I knew how to obtain. I have no proper identity and no idea how to get a new one or how to do anything else. There's no way this will work and the other version of me will live her life completely clueless, maybe until she finds out she was arrested somewhere. Even if none of those options occur, if I can't go back in time again, but I also don't get caught, what the hell happens then? I just have to explain everything to Artsky and myself? What would my thoughts have been if another version of myself had appeared like that in the midst that amidst the impact of Mia's death? There really wasn't a good possible way it could all end. Even though I'd chosen the sole path that could save Mia, achieving it was actually no guarantee. 
At this time tomorrow, I'll already have been in the tower, and I'll be thinking about the best way to act. If in the night I can pull off what I decide to do. What the hell will I say to the police? They'll immediately realize another me is in the hospital. I wonder what would happen if I revealed what the second Maya can do. They'd have to believe me due to my existence. And then what? Would they let me go with no real identity of my own? Would the second Maya be kept a secret? If so, there's no chance I'd be able to live anything akin to a normal life. Honestly, maybe getting caught by the police would be better. Or if I'm able to save Mia, I could reveal myself and then decide what to do. Yeah, they might, if they believe you, which they probably have to, they could just give you a new identity. I realised I just thought that and pitied myself. I've been feeling sporadic senses of liberty the past few days after being shut away for so long. So, that I'd seen an outcome deprived of any freedom was acceptable. It was just disheartening. It was undoubtedly absurd that I'd held off from going to the tower for so long. My hesitation could have doomed me at any point. I was just selfish. I wanted those tranquil days to continue despite knowing that they couldn't. Being in my living room was proof enough of that. It appeared to just be misfortune that what I wanted was the single thing that definitely couldn't happen. Ironically, there was no going back. The important decision had already been made, and I was only stalling out the clock. My mind hadn't changed, and if I went back to the time I decided, the result would be differ. It had been clear from the beginning that there'd be a no-win-win situation. However, even if I did change my mind, it likely wouldn't matter. It wasn't possible to go back to my old world. Not even with the second mile. If I travelled days through time, I wouldn't have been able to let everything play out as it did once. As it had once, anymore. There were people who travelled from the 15th and had changed history. In the blink of an eye, the world I'd always lived in had distance, distance from me so much that it was no longer reachable. So with no room for doubt, attempting to save Mia was what I had to do. I needed to figure out a way to travel days through time once more and save her. If I took the second mile before November 27th, that would be the best I could do, and then, after that would come a new decision, almost as important as the last. After lying on the floor for so long, my nervousness gradually dissipated. There was no way I'd be able to calm myself the next day, but the beige walls of my living room were oddly relaxing. I really was spending my last hours there, as unbelievable as it felt. I was in a situation I didn't think anyone else had ever been in, and I was the one who had chosen to go through with it alone. But I was at a point where I really had to believe in my decisions, and I was confident in thinking that giving myself the last day had been the right thing. I couldn't keep the myriad of thoughts from circling through my mind, but they eventually faded into the background. Time advanced, the light slowly abandoned the room. What the hell was I thinking? I had to keep so many things in mind that I couldn't really be surprised I'd made such a large oversight. I took Isla and Ed and his tickets to prevent them from going to the tower on the 15th. It sounded like a good idea because they could have sold out quickly. I completely ignored that they could simply print them out again. I don't think they'd have to buy new ones. I sighed, exasperated. I never had a printer, so I hadn't thought about it. I knew Artsky and I hadn't checked our tickets until the 14th, but we would have been able to print out new ones if they hadn't been there. How the hell do I do this then? Unless Edna and Isla don't notice that their tickets are gone until they're in the tower, it's very unlikely they'll be able to go anyway. At least in the case of Artsky and myself, it was seeing our tickets that had made us decide to go through with attending the event, so we might actually not go if I do take them. I really didn't want to think very hard about them, but I wasn't too worried. If I got caught by the police, Artsky and I probably wouldn't go to the event. But if I wasn't able to find the second Mire, I'd have to think of something else. Maybe a note wasn't a horrible idea, or I could break its printer. There had to be at least one way to stop Artsky and me from going. And Edna and Isla, if I'm not able to travel, I could just try to talk to them again, but I'm not sure what I'd say. I wonder if they'd accuse me of having stolen their tickets if I suddenly show up warning them not to go. I'll think about that tomorrow, after getting inside the tower. I hadn't moved in so long and I'd begun to feel tired. The sun was setting, so my body was requesting that I sleep at the same time I'd gotten accustomed to. Must be nice. But it seemed laughable to think I would be able to fall asleep. I could try to quell the onslaught of my thoughts, but there was no getting rid of them. I can't sleep until 4am, no matter what. I can get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, still can't go to sleep till 4am. It's insane. I mean, it's literally midnight right now. Once again, the same sharp pain hit me when I thought that... It could have been my last night in, my, in that apartment. If I managed to go back in time the next day, it really was possible I'd never rest in my bed again. I already thought of this, but 
I shouldn't take it lightly. How exactly am I going to get in the tower tomorrow night? If I'm getting tired at this time. I'd enter the tower with a plan in mind. Such a plan could entail trying to spend 12 hours there, or rushing out of the building at the second mile. While I wasn't sure yet, I didn't want to blow it due to a lack of sleep, and simply drinking coffee to stay awake had backfired numerous times. I thought of placing the clothes I'd washed into the wardrobe, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. There was nothing I could do but keep lying down, awaiting the time where I'd force myself into bed. But a while later, that time hadn't come. While I was tired, I couldn't manage to stand up, as that would mean finally abandoning the life I had. If I stayed on the floor, it would mean the last night in my bed had already happened, and for some reason I preferred that. I managed to stand up, but only to turn off the light. The room had become fully dark. I couldn't tell how much time had passed since I'd looked away from the small, red light on the TV. However, I knew it had been a while. My head rested on a cushion, and the feel of the carpet was comforting, even though I had no blanket. The heater allowed me to remain in the middle of the floor, contacting the table with my back. But I hadn't fallen asleep. I'd only sensed time passing, my vivid trains of thought and infinitely spiralling into chaotic repetition. That became mentally exhausting. I just wanted to fall asleep. It didn't seem like it would ever happen. The absolute silence had persisted for what must have been hours. At one point I realised that I'd fallen asleep just for my awareness to instantly blink back in. That might have happened a few more times. However, I still felt as if I'd been awake the whole time, desperately trying to lose consciousness. Was the sun going to rise at any point? I had to go to the tower in the morning, so that I had enough time to, until the next night. I thought of setting an alarm, but I could, couldn't briefly sleep and be drowsy on such an important day. I'd been thinking about grabbing my phone for a while, until I finally extended my arm and felt around the surface of the table. I dragged my phone toward me and shut my eyes tightly as I flipped it open. Soft blue lights soaked through my eyelids, prompting me to raise them. Then, I stared at the upper corner and waited for my blurry vision to fade. 523 it's so late. Next to the numbers, I saw the words, no service. Huh? I didn't think I'd seen them before, but I closed my phone to combat an abrupt headache. After that, I dropped my head back to the pillow, starting to seriously worry. There was no way I'd be in time for the event that would start in four hours. At least, that wasn't too important, but I didn't feel like I'd ever sleep, ever fall asleep. When I had to, when I had, I'd immediately reawakened. And once I'd seen the light of my phone, I couldn't get it out of my mind. The entrance fee on the 15th had been pretty expensive. I believed I had enough money in my wallet, but if not, I still had the option of buying a normal visit. I rolled onto my back. Being there, there was getting unbearable. Most of my stress had faded a long while ago, but that still hadn't been enough to fall asleep. The impression that I was wasting any of my time was intrusive. I finally sat up and noticed that I really wasn't tired. After a short time, my constricting headache started to fade. I grabbed my phone again. It was 5.30. On the 15th, we'd gone to the tower during the night because we hadn't been able to fall asleep. It was still very early though. If I go before sleeping, I could come back later and rest until the afternoon. If I had to spend a long time in the tower the next night, that would help me not be exhausted. It was doubtful I'd be able to sleep after coming back, when I'd finally be aware of the crucial details I needed. But since it was likely Arsky wouldn't be at home in, late in the day, I didn't think it was a terrible idea. There was no way I'd be able to lie back down again after sitting up, let alone sleep. I'd been on that carpet for so many hours. I was still a bit dizzy, but I managed to carefully stand in the darkness and step out of the room. More than three hours remained until nine o'clock, when the tower's halls would open to the public. On the 15th, though, Artsky and I had been in the lobby since much earlier. It might have been a bad idea, but I grabbed my coat and stepped into the pair of boots on the floor. I gripped the door and slowly pushed it open. Time to get our burglary on. The air was frigid as usual, but I couldn't feel any wind. A multitude of stars filled the dark sky, unmatched by a row of streetlights across the closest walkway. Not a soul could be seen, and the imposing atmosphere made me reconsider going out so early. I stepped forward, the snow stiff beneath my feet. 
I couldn't make out that layer of white anywhere but directly underneath the lights. I had my purse with me so I closed the door and descended the stairs, purposefully avoiding the frozen handrail. I looked in the direction of the tower, however for once I couldn't see it. There was no chance I'd get lost so I started to walk toward where it should have been. As the tower was on the outskirts, the streetlights soon ceased, making me hug the walls to know where I was. It wasn't very far, and despite the eerie scenery, I was glad I'd left my apartment. I had to be in the tower in the morning, and I knew its entrance opened far before 9 o'clock. A receptionist had been there when we'd arrived, so I could try to buy tickets for the event and think about questions I wanted to ask. I kept walking, hoping I was getting closer. I could hardly see anything a few steps ahead and as all lights had disappeared, I had to confirm the sensation of movement by looking at the ground. I started to see more of the round light bulbs in the distance. I knew what it meant. That was the plaza in front of Ashia Tower. I got closer and closer until I started to perceive the light, light's quiet buzz, then I followed the path with my eyes ending where the tower should have been. There it was, the immense building in the form of a huge shadow that covered me the many stars behind it. I slowly got closer to it interspersing the hum of lights with sharp steps. However, before I expected to, I hit a wall. It was the wall of the tower, which I suddenly hit with my foot. Startled, I felt it with my hand, expecting a cold stone. But I touched something else entirely. My fingers felt a smooth, glassy surface. And as I stared at it with confusion, my vision adjusted just enough to understand where I was. It was the door. No thick shutter was there either as I could recognise the floor of the lobby a step beyond the glass. I wondered to myself why I'd been surprised and immediately concluded that it was because there was no light. I suddenly hit the glass with no warning since the lights behind it weren't turned on. Instead of putting my hand back in my pocket, I grabbed, my, grabbed the phone. The screen displayed 548, then I hesitantly gripped the handle of the door and tried to open it. Like it seemed, it was locked. I stepped back carefully, trying to get a feel for my surroundings and all I determined was that I was completely alone. On the 15th, that door had been highlighted by the warm light behind it, and we'd entered it at 6 o'clock. That time was very close, and I began to wonder whether that had been a special occasion. Maybe they'd anticipated some people would come very early, and that was why the tower had been opened at 6 o'clock. Over three hours were left until 9 o'clock. When would the entrance open? I had no way to know how much I'd have to wait. I leaned on the icy metal of a nearby streetlight, the cold penetrating my back. The light made my misty breath visible, emphasising the harsh cold even further. Without a doubt, I wouldn't be able to stay there for long. I didn't take my eyes off the entrance, but I could hardly see it from where I moved to. As I waited outside, I knew people must have been behind the wall. At the very least, I knew someone was in the security room, waiting for a sudden attack that could have come at any moment. I stood, covering my neck as much as I could. The ring of lights let me see slightly ahead in every direction, but past them there was only darkness. I figured something had to happen soon, but even if I wanted to, I didn't feel capable of turning back. If I moved again, I wouldn't be able to withstand the temperature. And figure fatigue, physical fatigue was beginning to set back in. When I felt like I'd been there for some time, I slowly took my hand out of my fuzzy coat, and with my thumb I flipped open my phone to look at the time again. 6.03. It had only been a few minutes and the words no service is still there. I also looked at my phone on the 15th before we'd been asked to leave them behind with the guards. By 6.03, we'd already been allowed to step in. How much longer do I have to be here? Is the tower not going to open until 9? I was still staring at the building. Any moment the light behind the glass could turn on. Maybe someone could come and unlock it from the outside. There was no way we would remain closed for 3 more hours. Without the need to look at my phone, I knew the time was passing very slowly. The few minutes I'd been there had already felt much longer. But at the same time, they passed very quickly. Had I really been there for more than 20 minutes? It might have been the cold, but I felt as if even my mind had frozen through. A complete opposite from the spiralling mess it had been at home. I wanted to close my eyes and slowly sit on the ground. Everything around me was dark enough that it wouldn't have made much difference. And it almost felt like my body was gradually sliding down the streetlight anyway. I had hoped I was retaining enough of my scarce strength to be able to walk into the building when the time came. I still believed that the lights would suddenly turn on, but I hadn't sensed to think since I'd stopped moving. When I looked at the time again, it was 6.28. Once more, it seemed as if the last half hour had happened in an instant, while the next one would last an eternity. Why was nothing happening? 
Even though it was so early, why was I alone? On the 15th, the group of people waiting for the event had begun hours before it started. Had that never been the case before? Even so, when would the door open? It was horrible not knowing how long I'd have to be there for. The woman who was at the reception desk should have come at any time. She was here so early and so were the guards. Oh, Katai too. He said he'd been taking the daily sh da daily shifts recently, eh? Did he say when he started it? It should also be well before 9 o'clock. I can't do anything but keep waiting. I desperately need that, needed that door to open, and I had only managed to stay out in the cold for so long because I believed it would. I tried to move my right hand, but I couldn't feel the soft touch in my pocket anymore. Was something really going to happen? It was hard to breathe properly, and the sporadic soft wind began to feel painful. The harsh electric sound that I thought to be, a mi to be minor upon arriving was practically blaring. And with that, we should wrap this episode up here, because we're out of time for today, but we are finally doing it. We're in action. It's time to get in here and uh, get our hands on the Sekimara and see if that See if the uh, storeroom door is open. Which, you know, I doubt, but you never know. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging out with me, and I'll see you in the next one.